In this video, I want to show how we can build circuits for simple finite state machines in Logisim. In the last video, we saw how, given a sequential circuit, we could build a transition table or a state diagram for the finite state machine. So this time, we are going the other direction from the state diagram or transition table to a circuit. But let's start by building the first circuit from the last video in Logisim to demonstrate using a register component. In Logisim, we have various components that can store data under the memory heading. And in a finite state circuit, we want to store the current state in a register. In Logisim, the default bit width of a register is 8, but for the circuit from the last video, we only needed to store 2 bits in the register, so we can change that. And now we can think of this register as being composed of two flip-flops that each accept a new value when the clock ticks. The version of a register that's simulated in Logisim is more sophisticated than our two D-latch flip-flop. And in particular, we can select at which point in the clock cycle the register accepts a new input. For now, we'll leave it as the default rising edge, which means that this register will accept a new value when the clock transitions from 0 to 1. We need to give the register a clock signal as input. Sometimes we might have a global clock that would be an input to the subcircuit, but for now we can just add a clock within our subcircuit. So now we've connected the register to a clock, and we now need to give it inputs and outputs. Because the data bits for this register is 2, that means that the input and the output of this register are both two-wire bundles, and so we might want to use a splitter to access the individual wires of those bundles. The register also has two other input pins that we will make use of in homework 4, but not today. Those are the enable bit, which we've seen before, and a reset bit that sets the value in the register to zero asynchronously, meaning regardless of what the current input and the clock status are, if the clear bit goes to one, the value in the register is cleared. So now we want to set up the circuit so that the bit zero and one coming into the register correspond to the input to the flip-flops, and the bits 0 and 1 coming out of the register correspond to the outputs from the flip-flops from the previous video. I'll add an XOR gate, and I'll make it smaller, and give it two inputs, and then make a copy. And those two XOR gates each get one of their inputs from the output of the register looped back around. And then the top XOR gets its other input from the input pin. And the bottom one gets the AND of the low order bit and the input pin. We can clean that up a bit and connect the XORs into the register. And then we add our output pin, which connects to the high order bit from the register. And now that we've implemented this circuit in Logisim with a register, we can use the poke tool to advance the clock and see how this finite state circuit transitions from one state to the next. The state here is represented by the value stored in the register, and as we saw in the previous video, if the input to the circuit is zero, then when the clock ticks, that has no effect on the state. The finite state machine remains in whatever state it was in as long as the input is zero. But if the input is one, now, when the clock ticks, the state will transition from 0 to 1. And on the next clock cycle, it'll transition from 1 to 2, 
and then from 2 to 3. And if the input is 0, again, further ticks of the clock don't change the state. But then if we get another input of 1 and the clock ticks, our next state is 0. So we can think of this circuit as implementing a 2-bit counter. It is counting the number of time steps on which it has had an input of 1, but it is counting mod 4 because it rolls back to 0 every time it counts past 3. Let's move on to the more interesting finite state machine from the previous video, the one that was trying to recognize the specific sequence of inputs 101 and output a 1 whenever that was the sequence of most recent inputs and output 0 the rest of the time. As we saw, we can build a state transition table for this finite state machine, and we could think of this state transition table as a truth table from which we could build a circuit. For example, when the state is 1 and the input is 0, we want the next state to be 2, and so we could set up circuitry such that when the output of the register is 0, 1, and the input is 0, then we want the next input to the register to be 1, 0. Here I've started to construct a circuit based on this state transition table. The idea here is that these eight AND gates are each detecting one of the possible combinations of a state and an input. For example, if we set the state to 0 and the input to 1, that will cause this AND gate to output a 1, and we could then build circuitry that ensures that when this AND gate outputs a 1, we should be giving to the register a next state of 1, because we are in state 0 and the input is 1, and so we want to give 0, 1 into the register so that that will be the circuit's next state. But this seems like an extremely tedious way of building a circuit from a state transition table, and so we should think about whether there is a simpler way that we could achieve the same task. And luckily there is. This sequence of eight AND gates that are detecting all of the possible combinations of inputs looks a lot like the internals of an eight-way multiplexer. So we can instead build a version of this circuit that is based on an eight-way multiplexer. Again, we'll start with a register, and we'll set the register's data bits to two, and we'll give the register a clock signal as input, and we'll put a splitter on the output of the register so that we can determine the output for the circuit. In particular, we want this circuit to output a 0 if it's in state 0, 1, or 2, and output a 1 if it's in state 3. And so, from the two bits of the state, we can AND them together, and only when they are both 1 should we be outputting 1 from the circuit as a whole. So now our task is to set up the input to this register to match the state transition table, and as indicated, we're going to do that with an 8-way multiplexer. We'll add a multiplexer component. We'll turn off the enable for the multiplexer, and we'll change the select bits to 3, because we want the multiplexer to be able to select among the eight different possible entries in the state transition table. Also, we want this multiplexer to output a 2-bit value, because there are two bits to the state that is being stored in the register, so we'll change the data bits to 2. And in this case, I find it convenient to move the select bits for the multiplexer from the bottom to the top, And now we want to set up the inputs to the multiplexer to correspond to the entries in the state transition table. 
and we want the select bits for the multiplexer to be based on the previous state and the input, which determines which state we're going to transition to next, and therefore which bits we're going to give to the register. Let's add an input pin to the circuit, and let's bring these outputs from the register, which represent the previous state, around to be available as part of our select input. Now let's add a splitter, which will make face north and have a fan in and fan out of three, and I'll make it centered. And so the three select bits for the multiplexer will come from three wires, and we want those to be based on the input to the circuit and the previous state. So let's connect up the bits of the previous state to the low order bits here, and we'll connect up the circuit input to the high order bit. So when the input is zero, that corresponds to the first column of our transition table, and when the input is one, that corresponds to the second column, and the bits of the previous state will control the low order bits here, and that will correspond to the row of the state transition table. And so now we want to have this multiplexer select the correct next state based on the current input and the previous state of the circuit. And we can do that by giving as input to the multiplexer a series of two-bit constants. So I'll change the data bits to two, and I'll change the value to the next state that I want selected when the input is zero and the previous state was zero, which from the state transition table we see should be zero. So I'll enter the hex value 0x0, zero zero, and that will give me a 2-bit zero value for this particular constant. I'm now going to make some copies of this constant that will be the input to the other elements of the multiplexer. And I probably need to give myself a bit more room to work. And now that we've connected up all of these constants to the inputs of the multiplexer, the select bits will determine which of these inputs become the next state that will get saved into the register. And so we want to set up the value of these constants to correspond to the correct next state based on the bits of the previous state and the current input. When the previous state is zero and the input is zero, we want the next state to be zero, and so this top constant is correct. The next constant corresponds to select bits 0, 0, 1, so that's when the input is zero and the previous state is zero, 1, and so in row 1, column 0 of our table, we see that we want the next state in that case to be 2. And so we can use the select tool to choose this constant and change its value to 0x2. Continuing down the transition table, when we're in state 2 and have an input of 0, we want the next state to be 0, and that corresponds to select bits 0, 1, 0, so we want this constant to be 0, and then for inputs 0, 1, 1, that corresponds to an input of 0 and a state of 3, and so there we want the next state to again be 2, and so we can change this constant to 0x2. Now for the bottom half of the inputs to the multiplexer, those correspond to the first bit of the select being 1, which means the cases where the input to the circuit is 1, and so that's the right-hand column of our state transition table. And there we will have next states of 1, 1, 3, 1, 
and we can set the constants accordingly. And now our multiplexer is selecting among constants that correspond to the next states from our transition table, and so it should be the case that when we tick the clock, we get a sequence of states that correspond to what we would expect following the state transition diagram for the finite state machine. We start in state 0, and if the input is 0, then when the clock ticks we should stay in state 0. Let's verify that. No change of the value stored in the register. But if we're in state 0 and we see an input of 1, then we should transition to state 1. So let's change the input, and now we'll tick the clock. And our register is now storing a 1, so our circuit has transitioned to state 1. From this state, if we see another one, we should stay in the same state, so ticking the clock again should keep the register at 1, and it does. And if we see a 0, then we should transition to state 2. If I change the input and tick the clock, now we're in state 2. So now that we are in state 2, the output of the register is 1, 0. And we can see that more clearly using a probe tool in Logisim. So what's stored in the register displays in hexadecimal here, but if we want to see the binary representation, we can put a probe that just tells us the value that's being carried on this bundle of wires. So the output here from the register is 1, 0, and that means that the inputs to the multiplexer will have a 0 and a 1 in the low order bits, and then the high order bit will be determined by the input to the circuit. So if I were to tick the clock again right now, we would select the second of the inputs to the multiplexer, which would be 0, so we would transition back to state 0, but if instead the input were 1, then we would select input 6 from the multiplexer, which is state 3. So if we tick the clock one more time, now the register is storing a 3, and the probe on the output of the register shows us that the bits are 1, 1, and we see that the output of our circuit has lit up for the first time because when we are in state 3, we want to output a 1, and we designed our AND gate based on the outputs of the register to do exactly that. From state 3, we might transition back to either state 2 or state 1, depending on what input we see on the next clock tick. And so if the input is still 1, we should transition to state 1, and that's exactly what happens. So this approach to building a circuit that implements a particular finite state machine was way easier than trying to build all of the logic from scratch ourselves, but this row of constants being input to the multiplexer seems kind of weird and isn't the way that sequential circuits are usually designed because there are other components that achieve the same behavior as this idea of constants going into a multiplexer. In particular, our sequence of constants going into a multiplexer is behaving as a type of read-only memory, and in Logisim we have, under the memory heading, a ROM component which stands for read-only memory. So let's build another version of this circuit that takes advantage of the actual Logisim component for read-only memory. I'm going to start by copying and pasting the multiplexer version of the circuit, but now I'm going to remove the multiplexer and all of the constants, and we're going to replace those with the much more sensible option of the built-in ROM component. So if I select the read-only memory and place it on the canvas, we get a very large component, 
and that indicates that Logisim is happy to have quite a lot of data stored in a read-only memory, but for our purposes, we only need it to store enough data to list all of the possible next states that we would want to transition to based on our transition table. So with eight entries in our transition table, we want a ROM that stores eight entries. If we select our ROM component and edit its attributes, we see that the address bit width is one of the things we can modify, and that corresponds to the size of the bundle that comes in on this address wire. For our current purposes, this address wire corresponds to the select bits of the multiplexer version we just built, and so if we set this bit width to 3, that corresponds to our three select bits from the multiplexer version of the circuit. And when we set this bit width to 3, we now see that there are only eight distinct values being stored in the ROM, which corresponds to the eight constants that we had in the previous version of the circuit. So now let's highlight all of these and drag them over to where we can connect up what was our select bits to the address input of the ROM. And now that the ROM is receiving an address input, it is highlighting that the thing it is going to output is what is at this location. But if we toggle the input bit to 1, then the bundle of three bits coming in on the address wire now has the value 100, and so the ROM is indicating that it will output the data at address 4. And if we connect the output of the ROM to the input of the register, we get incompatible widths, because each of the values being stored in the read-only memory is a two-digit hex value, meaning eight bits, and our register is only expecting two bits of input, so we can select the ROM and change the data bit width, that is the output from the memory, to two. And now we have eight entries that are all each storing just two bits of data, and our output bundle from the ROM matches up with the input bundle for the register. So the current status of this circuit corresponds to the multiplexer version of the circuit when we had eight constants that all had the value zero going into the multiplexer, because all of the values stored in the read-only memory are currently zero. So what we need to do now is change the values stored in the memory to correspond to the values from our state transition table so that, for example, when the ROM outputs the data at address 100, it will output a 1. We change the data that's stored in the ROM by right-clicking and choosing Edit Contents. I just experienced a Logisim crash and unfortunately hadn't saved, so I had to recreate the entire circuit. So let this serve as a reminder to you that you should be saving frequently while working in Logisim. But luckily I did figure out how to change the color scheme so that when we edit the contents of the read-only memory, you can now see what I'm doing. What we want to do now is fill in this read-only memory with the same sequence of values that we gave as the constants to the multiplexer in the last circuit. And so, in this hex editor, I want to change the values to correspond to the first column of the table, followed by the second column of the table. And unfortunately, when I close the window, it doesn't automatically update the ROM with the values that I entered. So instead, what I'll need to do is, when we edit the contents, we can save this to a file. I'll save it to a file on my desktop called 101 Recognizer ROM. And then, back on the circuit canvas, I can right-click the ROM and choose Load Image, 
and from my desktop I can choose the file I just saved. And so now we've loaded the contents of the read-only memory with the columns of the state transition table. So now if we simulate time steps of this circuit, when the clock ticks with input 0, we stay in state 0, but if we change the input to 1, now the ROM is receiving address 110, and so it will output the data at location 4, and so the data output of the ROM, as indicated by our probe, is 01. And so the next time the clock ticks, that 01 value will be stored into the register. And so now the register is storing that we are in state 1 and is outputting the bits 01, which are then being fed back in as the next state portion of the address that we are giving to the ROM. So we are currently giving the ROM address 5, and so if we were to tick the clock, then the output of the ROM that gets saved into the register is still the value 1, and so the state doesn't change. And that's the behavior that we want for state 1 of our finite state machine. But if we're in state 1 and we see input 0, then we should transition to state 2. And here, if we change this input to 0, now the address being given to the ROM is 001, and at location 1 in the ROM we've stored a 2, so the data output from the ROM is 1, 0, and when the clock ticks, that 1, 0, 2 in binary, will be stored in the register, and so now we're in state 2, and the register is outputting that state, 1, 0. From state 2, if we want to transition to state 3, we could give it an input of 1, and now with inputs 1, 1, 0, the ROM is receiving address 6, where there is a 3 stored, and so the data output will be 1, 1, and when the clock next ticks, that will update the value stored in the register, and so we are in state 3, and when in state 3, the bits output from the register are both 1, and so our AND gate outputs a 1, and the whole circuit has an output of 1. And so now we have a general approach for taking a state transition table of a finite state machine and turning it into data stored in read-only memory within our circuit, and then we can use the information that governs the transition table, namely the state and the input, as the address bits to the read-only memory, which will then tell us, based on the state and input, what should be our next state that gets stored in the register representing the current state of the circuit. And in homework 4, we will use exactly this approach to build the control circuitry that governs the behavior of the entire simulated CPU, and the primary task that you will need to implement is figuring out for the CPU control circuitry that we want to implement, what do we need to put in the read-only memory so that the state transitions operate correctly to govern the behavior of the entire CPU.